Hello. Hello. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. Good, yes, good morning. So this is ships and modules. Uh, we are going to, uh, well, first, I guess, introductions. I'm CCP Rise. I'm CCP Fozzie. And I'm CCP Larrikin. And we are, uh, I would say, the bulk of the balance team. But of course, mm -hmm. a lot of people make contributions, and there's a lot of others involved. So don't blame us for everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this is the plan. Uh, we're going to talk a bit through what's happened in the last year since last FanFest. Um, then these guys are going to go over the Citadel uh, expansion and what's coming up. And then we're going to look forward into the future a bit. So uh, yeah, that's, that's what we have in store for you. Um, to start off, I'm just going to run through yeah, what, what's happened in the last year and show you guys a couple pictures, although I feel pretty inadequate about my graphs because of CCP quant. But <laughs> It's like, I guess that's, that's normal. <laughs> um, so yeah, the start off for last year, uh, something funny that I kind of forgot about until uh, I went to make this presentation is that last FanFest was all about the Ishtar. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> it used to be a problem. <laughs> Um, and this was pretty much, yeah, the, the right following FanFest last year uh, was when we started making our like fourth and fifth changes to the Ishtar. Um, this is a picture of what damage looks like for the top three uh, hacks um, for the last year. And uh, I've put the, uh, yeah, the two uh, other most popular ones on there, which would be the Vagabond and the Cerberus. Cerberus is in green. And you can see where the Ishtar was. And when it was at this stage before, um, it was uh, dominating damage across the game, basically. It was doing more in PvP than really anything else. Um, this is uh, when we made our first change to it, um, which apparently wasn't enough. Uh, it started to head down a bit in popularity after that. Um, but it wasn't until here, when we made the shift to the slot layout, that we actually saw it uh, return to sort of a normal state <laughs> for ships in the game. Um, so that's kind of cool. It's, it seems to be in a pretty OK place now, uh, still sitting high um, as far as hacks go, but um, not even the most popular anymore. Now the Cerberus has taken over. Mm -hmm. um, last year, uh, we did some things with Tech 3 Destroyers. Uh, following FanFest last year, we introduced the Jackdaw and then the uh, Hecate a little bit later. Um, and we actually made some uh, uh, nerfs, small nerfs, to the Sveeple and Confessor right after FanFest as well. Um, obviously, these are still uh, in a very, very strong place. And uh, like Fozzie said during the design panel, they're uh, high on the list for getting another look sometime soon. Um, hopefully, Keeping the, the gameplay, which we think is really interesting, strong, and maybe even highlighting it more, but at the same time bringing down the power level a bit so that you guys uh, stop calling them diseases and whatever, you know, <laughs> ships shouldn't be diseases, <laughs> <laughs> except for the Orthrus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, after this, uh, we, we did also some work to missiles. I don't know if you guys remember that. We added uh, missile guidance modules and then later uh, missile disruption modules. And we made a buff to heavy missiles. Um, obviously, rapid lights are still in a pretty strong place. Um, but what happened with heavy missiles is pretty positive. This is uh, the three um, Tech 2 missile systems uh, that are most, uh, or for medium ships, sorry. So on top, you have rapid lights. And this is PVP damage. Um, rapid lights on top, and then hams in blue, and heavy missiles in yellow. And you can see after the change we made, heavy missiles climbed up to sit about even with hams. Uh, they're still both uh, below rapid lights. Uh, this is definitely something we need to keep looking at. Um, rapid lights have been in a pretty strong place for quite a while now, and it's possible that you know there's a little tweaking needed there. Um, by the way, these, uh, the PVP damage graphs, we've actually made some good changes to the way we gather those metrics. Um, it used to be that uh, we actually couldn't see the difference between damage to structures uh, and just damage in combat. We've improved a lot of that. And so everything you see, uh, at least in my stuff, here is, is, is uh, excluding structure damage. So this is actual uh, normal shooting at people. But outside of PVP, um, this is the number of activations by module type um, for the four most popular missile systems. And obviously, you know, that's a little bit confusing to make sense of because of the difference in cycle time. You, 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 know, you can't just read these as even with each other. But uh, the main point here is to show that both crews and heavies, which uh, seem weaker if you talk about PvP, are getting enormous amount of use in PvE. And so there's, there's some balance because of that as well. 
um, with heavy missiles uh, sitting at you know, 34 million activations instead of 6 million for rapid lights. And this is in the last 30 days, I believe. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, rebalanced battle cruisers. Um, which is pretty cool, added a new roll bonus to give combat battlecruisers more range uh, and made a lot of just general changes to um, the whole set. And that went really well. This is uh, PvP uh, damage dealt by combat battlecruisers and you can see it roughly doubled. Um, and you'll see uh, just in a little bit, compared to other ship classes, this has moved combat battlecruisers actually into a, uh, a very kind of even place with a lot of the other popular ship classes. So a lot of increased usage there, which is really cool. Uh, we added this uh, mining frigate, which, <laughs> which someone uses. Um, <laughs> no, 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 Ed, this has provided a cool niche uh, along with the prospect. It's not quite as popular as the prospect, but it's definitely um, finding a place, which is awesome. Um, we added new Tech 2 logistics frigates as well. And uh, <laughs> those, are, those are going really well. Um, they're, again, um, I suppose like with most Tech 2 ships, not quite as common as the, the Tech 1 logistics frigates because you know, of cost and access, but um, Larrikin says they're super cool and amazing. A plus. <laughs> How many of you guys have seen uh, Findrew's Lodgy Night Force video? Yeah. No one. Really no one? <laughs> All right, that's what we're going to do after this presentation. I don't know who's next. We're just going to show that video. <laughs> Cancel it and watch <laughs> Ventura PvP. Um, but yeah, created a lot of new... You all uh, need to see it. Uh, really good new options for compositions at small scales, which is great. Um, also added Navy Disruption Frigates. Uh, it was interesting looking into kind of the performance of these. They uh, are actually super uncommon relative especially to, uh, you know, normal Tech 1 Frigates, which are everywhere, um, of course. But they're extremely efficient. Um, people who are using these are almost exclusively uh, doing a lot of very micro scale uh, PvP and low sec. Um, there's other applications, of course, but they're showing up a lot there. And where they do show up, they're very strong. They've, uh, you know, they're, yeah, super efficient. They, they uh, do really well when people take the time to figure out uh, how to apply them. So that's really fun to see. And uh, my favorite uh, ship. The new uh, Command Destroyers we added, which uh, was just a lot of fun, um, we, like we were talking about the game design panel, uh, we have a lot of ideas sort of kicking around over time and we got an opportunity um, to take one and run with it and the whole time we were running we were thinking that something was bound to break and we wouldn't be allowed to do this because it seemed pretty wild um, and we, we definitely didn't know how it would get used or what would happen uh, and it turned out that we were able to get it through without finding anything that would break really badly and it's been a lot of fun. Um, I have a little picture, um, I, like I said um, earlier, I'm always looking for cool videos of people using this and this is a, 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 from a video from the fight in uh, X36Y a few weeks ago and you can see a fleet uh, at the top of the screen. Um, this is from the point of view of a Cerberus pilot who's in uh, a small, um, I don't remember, Shadow Cartel fleet. But you can see just at the start of this video from the middle of the fleet, there goes their Lodgy wing. <laughs> 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 uh, which is just, you know, pretty wild. And, you, you know, as the video goes on, you can see them, like, trying to run back to the fleet as fast as they can, and they're getting picked off and stuff, and that's just super cool. Another uh, really fun thing that happened with Command Destroyers was when uh, I went to fix a defect in... Uh, you know, you guys don't know how the internal tools look, but this is a drop down with about 100,000 uh, entries uh, for attributes we can add to the ship. I was trying to add one to disallow them uh, from high sec, but I accidentally clicked Empire, which includes low sec, uh, which meant that this actually ended up going to singularity um, and. Uh, you guys thought that we were removing them from low sec, which spawned a bit of a thread. Uh, this is uh, like, you know, 480 comments uh, and uh, was really funny to see the things people had to say. Uh, well, funny and uh, really reassuring, actually. It sounds like there was a lot of fun happening, um, you know. We need to start doing this for all of our ships. If no one complains, then we just leave it broken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just test. Yeah. This was like, uh, you know, really, <laughs> even though it was, a, you know, a bit harsh possibly, it was uh, good reassurance that fun things were happening and it, it was cool to see that people, uh, would, are, you know, want, want to have this. So that was kind of cool. Um, we made some adjustments to uh, some disease ships. Um, uh, you know, changed uh, all of them to make them a bit weaker, lowered the damage bonus on the Orthrus, uh, and brought down uh, the slot count on the um, Gila and 
uh, worm, which is good. And you know, we're going to keep, keep an eye on those, uh, make sure that they're not too out of hand. Um, we made big changes to fall off uh, for a lot of different types of modules. Um, which has been really cool. It uh, added options for new modules like this, this Stasis Grappler, uh, and it, it made really good improvements that we've been wanting to make a long time to um, a lot of fleet dynamics because of the way falloff worked before. We had some pretty um, weird uh, behavior, with, especially with damps, and getting to change that has been a really good and healthy thing. And finally, we've done, or not quite finally, but we've done quite a lot of module tier side. I actually got so, uh, like, overwhelmed looking for all the groups that we've changed that I just didn't bother writing them all. I grabbed some of the ones that uh, were biggest and most obvious, but we've done probably, I don't know, a thousand modules or more. A lot, yeah. A ton I, of I time. deleted a hundred um, signal amplifiers, or the, the backup, <laughs> sensor backup arrays, over a hundred sensor backup arrays from the game. <laughs> Why did we have a hundred sensor backup arrays? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the last thing I wanted to show just for the last year, this is uh, the last year of, and you know, this, you guys can post this and go look at it in more detail, but this is uh, damage, PVP damage by ship group, so by class basically, for the 10 most popular ships. And just some highlights up top in blue is Tech 1 Cruisers. There's obviously a lot of those, but they're also very popular. They make the bulk of a lot of um, fleets, caracals, and a lot of other things. And so they sit pretty high above everything else. And then, you know, we see a pretty healthy mix below that actually. The bright red is battleships, uh, which have made a sort of slow um, climb over the course of the year. And then under that, you have Tech 3 Destroyers, Hacks, um, Dreads are actually in there. And Tech 1 frigates, Tech 3 cruisers, combat battle cruisers, and then down at the bottom, stealth bombers and attack battle cruisers. So um, a really cool mix there and, and some good dynamics changes over the course of the year. You can see um, Tech 3 destroyers climbing as we added the second two, and you can see combat battle cruisers make that big jump up. And so this is, this is good. Uh, we feel pretty good about this. And um, yeah, that's kind of yeah. what's happened in the last 365 days. And we'll uh, now talk about what's coming up. Mm -hmm. All right, so in, what is it now? Five, five days? Five days. Five days. Uh, we've got an expansion coming out. That's pretty exciting. Uh, EVE Online Citadel. And uh, there's a lot of really awesome stuff coming in Citadel. Um, one of the big things that we worked on for it uh, is capital ships. So some of the stuff you guys know I'm going to go through kind of quickly, but if you are not completely up to date, uh, we made a new plan for organizing the way, the roles of capital ships. So um, at the, in at the moment on TQ, before Citadel. Uh, carriers had kind of a lot of hats that they wore, um, so we decided to split that off into its own role, the Force Auxiliary ships that would take that role. Uh, you'll notice there's still an open spot for Super Cap Force Auxiliary someday, which we would definitely like to fill in the future, uh, but we'll see how the first ones goes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, with Dreadnoughts and Titans being the gunships, carriers, Super Carriers being the progression of um, fighter carriers, and then uh, for series for Lodges. We also made the change to make sure that uh, all of the capitals had uh, fleet hangers and ship hangers so that you didn't need to use a carrier as your uh, suitcase ship. If you want to move around with a dreadnought, you can definitely do that too, so that's coming as well. Um, we added to get this new role the Force Auxiliary ships. Um, every carrier on patch day that has a triage module fitted will become a Force Auxiliary. Uh, so we'll be doing that conversion, and then you'll, of course, be able to build new ones as well. Um, the role bonus, they can fit triage modules. Carriers can no longer do that. Um, they can use Warfare Links. Uh, that's a role from carriers that we've moved across uh, and give them some extra bonuses to them as well. Um, and uh, they have logistics drone transfer bonuses, which is really cool. It's something that we can now do because we took away, we, we switched out the uh, triage penalty. Instead of removing your ability to have any drones out at all, to control drones, it removes any damage your drones do. So you can still use E-War drones, you can still use rep drones while you're in triage. So it gives you another little thing to micromanage and have some fun with. Uh, this is the Apostle. Um, really great bonuses to uh, rogue capacitor transmitter and remote armor repair. If you've flown a triage uh, Archon, you'll uh, recognize uh, kind of the gameplay here. Um, and it has a, a strength bonus to uh, the armored and information warfare links. And you'll see this pattern continuing. So here's the Minakawa, which is, I think, personally my favorite of the looks of them. It is a gorgeous ship. It's great when it's skinned, too. So hopefully we'll get some really good skins out for you soon. 
the Ninazu, uh, which gives a local armor repair bonus uh, for some nice burst. We have a really cool bonus to capacitor booster charge strength um, on these two, uh, which is, a, I think, going to be an extremely powerful bonus. It's probably one of the bonuses we're most worried about being overpowered, but we'll see how it goes. This is kind of like the Command Destroyers in that we're, like, it could be ridiculous, but We've, one way or another, it's going to be fun. Yeah, we've already seen some crazy fits where people are just eschewing all cap regen and just using cap boosters mm -hmm. and do not care about newts at all, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then the lift also gets that uh, booster charge strength uh, for tanks and shields. Uh, and then we got the carriers themselves. So yeah, let's talk about carriers. Uh, they can no longer launch any drones, and instead they launch three different fighter squadrons. So fighter squadrons work a little bit differently, but I'll be talking about them very shortly. Uh, at downtime on patch day, uh, all of the fighters in your drone bay will be moved to your fighter bay, uh, and any drones uh, in your drone bay will be moved to your home station. So you'll just have the uh, carrier romping around with your fighters. Uh, we've also developed a brand new module for the carriers that we're calling a network sensor array. It's kind of like a siege module, except that it doesn't mean that you can't move and it doesn't stop remote repairs. All it does is stop you from using uh, remote e-war, so target painters, webifiers, and that sort of thing. You can still use neutralizers and Nosferatu, uh, but it really increases your lock speed. So if, you're dedic if you have a, a carrier dedicated uh, for space superiority, sh space superiority uh, shooting down uh, enemy fighters, then you're probably going to want to use this. Um, Again, they can fit the three uh, warfare links now. You don't need to use command processes, command processes to be able to fit a full three. And all of the modules that affect drones will affect fighters, except for the drone link augmenters. So drone link augmenters generally give a bonus to your drone control range. But you don't really need that with fighters at all. Yeah, there is no drone control range with fighters. If you can mm -hmm. see that, if you're on the same grid with a fighter, you can control it. So in some cases, that's like 80. What, 80,000 kilometers or something crazy you like that? You can get that? some ridiculous uh, grids, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, we're also changing the way drone control units work. So currently, a drone control unit is a high slot module that can be fit to a carrier or a super carrier and will let you launch an additional fighter. They're becoming uh, fighter support units, and they don't let you launch additional fighters. Instead, they just increase the amount of damage, uh, the speed that your fighters go, the amount of HP, and that sort of thing. Uh, and lastly, the advanced drone interfacing skill, which was the skill that you needed to fit the drone control units, becomes fighter hangar management, and it increases the size of your fighter hangar. Uh, talking about the individual carriers themselves, the Alcon and Chimera are kind of retaining their traditional role. They focus a little bit more on tank, while the Thanatos and now the Nidhogger is changing a little bit. It doesn't get the remote repair bonuses. Instead, they both get fighter uh, damage bonuses, with the Thanatos focusing on fighter uh, hit points and the Nidhogger focusing on fighter speed. Uh, they also all receive bonuses to their racial support fighters. So, for example, the Nidhogger uh, receives a range bonus to its, I can't remember what that fighter's called, but we'll find out in just a second, but it's <laughs> webifying fighters. Yeah. Uh, Graham, I think. No, wait, that's a light fighter. I don't forget. It's on a slide. We made too many of them. There's yes. a lot of names. <laughs> Oh, yes, there we go. There Bang. we go. The web fighter. Thanks, Drummy. Mate. Yes. Uh, and on patch day, the number of fighters are getting multiplied. So if you're running light fighters, which is uh, currently just any fighter that's not a fighter bomber, uh, they will be multiplied by six. And if you have fighter, uh, heavy fighters or fighter bombers, they will be multiplied by four. Their build requirements are changing as well, obviously. So let's actually talk about the fighters. Uh, you don't launch a single fighter anymore. Instead, you will uh, get together a whole bunch of fighters, put them into a fighter launch tube, and launch them out as a single unit. Carriers can launch three, super carriers can launch five, and that single unit, that squadron of fighters, acts as one space object. Um, you still have to kill all the fighters in it. If you start shooting at that squadron, you lock the whole squadron as a whole, and you start shooting at it, but we'll show you a little bit about that shortly. Uh, each fighter dies sequentially until there's no more left, and then you get a nice kill mail. So we've got the Templars, Dragonflies, Fireborgs, and I can't say that word, but the Mimitar fighters. Uh, these are just the existing ones. These are the three abilities that they get. So all the fighters now have a number of different abilities. And then we've introduced a second set of uh, what we're calling light fighters, the Equite, Locust, Setar, and Gram. And these are focused on space superiority. So they have a micro-missile swarm that is really effective at shooting down other fighters, but doesn't do whole much, a whole bunch of damage to uh, regular ships. Although it does, like a single squadron of uh, equites does about the same damage as like a, a 
flight of five warriors to normal ships, but a whole bunch more to drones and fighters. They also have uh, a propulsion ability, which is evasive maneuvers, and what that does, it's kind of like an afterburner, and it also reduces the amount of damage they take, so we're really excited to see what people do there. And uh, a specialized like fighter tackle ability, um, that if you activate on an enemy fighter squadron, they can't use their micro warp drive or micro jump drive or anything like that, uh, and it also webifies them. But it can only be activated on drones and fighters, it can't be activated on anything else. Let's go have a look at the support fighters. Every race gets a type of support fighter, the Cinebites, Scarabs, Sirens, and Drummies. Uh, and they all have kind of their racial E-war there, so, as well as a micro warp drive. And lastly, oh sorry, not quite lastly, we have the heavy fighters. So these are what were fighter bombers, they're becoming heavy fighters. The traditional ones, the ones that exist on TQ right now, the Molius, Mantis, Cyclops, and Turfling, uh, they get a short range, high damaging attack. It's, it's kind of... I'm not going to talk about application just yet. <laughs> as well as a, a micro warp drive and a torpedo server that does quite a bunch of damage, but it only has six charges, so after firing those, you actually need to bring it back to the carrier. It'll land, it'll take time to reload, you can launch it again and off you go again. Uh, and then we're introducing a second set, which you can see on the screen there. The, I'm not going to try and pronounce those. And they have a much longer range weapon. So those weapons actually go up to about 40 kilometers or so, so you can actually launch these to hit uh, pauses and that sort of thing, uh, as well as a micro jump drive. And they can launch a bomb. Some of the sharp right of you out there might have seen the micro something or other bombs. Uh, uh, on the, the micro, yeah, just the micro concussion bomb, micro shrapnel bomb, yeah. the whole list, yeah. So they can actually launch a bomb. Uh, they don't cloak, though. And finally, we have the Shadow, <laughs> which has a short range weapon. It does a whole bunch more damage than the, uh, the regular torpedo heavy fighters. Has an afterburner, which makes it even harder to hit. And has a special ability called True Sacrifice. And anyone want to guess what that does? <laughs> makes things explode. Uh, there's a whole, some lore there, but let's not worry yeah, about basically that. Basically, the, the shadows are being flown by cyberspace zombies, and uh, at your whim, they will collide themselves into an opposing ship, and everyone explodes. Uh, it does quite a bit of damage, but of course, you're also sacrificing a uh, squadron of shadows, so it's not cheap. Um, it's it's like more of a uh, like last ditch. Uh, maneuver, then I doubt people are going to want to just use it uh, all the time. It is like two and a half build, but it's kind of like a doomsday, so. Well, it's less damage, but... You know. A little bit less, yeah. Uh, but let's look, go look at the fighters and see how these actually work. All this is on uh, CC right now. Uh, so we can open up our inv inventory just there, and you can see us dragging the fighters into the different launch tubes. So this is a supercarrier. I think I'm flying a Hell at the moment, because it's clearly the best supercarrier. And uh, just dragging them up into the, into the five different uh, launch tubes. So each of uh, the light, sorry, the regular carriers, they have three launch tubes, and they can launch three light squadrons uh, and up to one support squadron, so any mix of that, like which is really just three light squadrons or two and a single support squadron. Uh, while the super carriers can launch uh, three lights, three heavies, and two support, or some sort of combination, while they will remain within that sort of five maximum. Uh, but we can, what's the next video I've got here? Ah, yes, and to switch to the actual fighter UI, there's a little button down the bottom left of your modules here, and you can just load your fighters there as well. You can right click on an empty tube and load your fighters. You don't have to open up your uh, cargo bay to load them because that does take quite a lot of screen real estate. But if you want to be able to use your modules as well as your fighters at the same time, you can just drag that up and you can see both of them and activate the abilities and your modules all at the same time nice and easily. You can drag that in position wherever you want it on the screen. And if you click on the button again, it just snaps back down to your module area. <coughs> so uh, let's launch our fighters and play around with them a little bit here. That's launching our fighters. There's a launch all button and there's also a recall all button. Uh, and if you can see down the bottom here, I'll even try this little lasery thing. There we go, just down the bottom. You can see at the moment we have the uh, ship selected and all of the different fighters selected over there. And if we go and zoom in at one of our, uh, one of our fighters, you can see the awesome work the art guys have got done flying around as a squadron. And if you want to give commands to all your fighters at once, you just need to choose what fighters you have selected. I think we will actually, uh, you can do that with your carrier as well. That's why there's a ship selection on the carrier, so you can tell all of your fighters and carrier to move somewhere or whatever you want to do. Uh, but let's look a little bit at maneuvering these. So, <coughs> I can't remember, oh, that's right. 
So you can give fighters any command you can give a carrier or a ship or any ship. So in this case, I'm just telling them to orbit an object. I select the fighters that I want, right click on the object like I would with a ship, select orbit, keep it range, approach, all of that stuff. Your fighters are going to go and do that. When you tell them to attack, they'll automatically start orbiting at their default range, but then you can just give them movement orders. So in this case here, I've told a, uh, a squadron of fighters to attack a hapless uh, phoenix, and then just told them to stop because I'm not worried about the phoenix shooting down my fighters. Uh, you can also see at the top there, we've used some of the heavy missile salvos and torpedo salvos, and they use charges as you use them, and you have to bring back to, to renew that. So yeah, the, the super carriers are also getting uh, the same treatment, uh, like uh, Hooper said, like Larrikin said, uh, able to uh, <laughs> launch more uh, fighters. Uh, they can use the network sensor array as well. Uh, they also are getting a new set of super weapons uh, that are inspired by the ECM burst that they already had called burst projectors. So these allow you to uh, designate a spot in space and send a uh, beacon to that location that'll then explode and do some electronic warfare. Uh, to every ship that's hit by it. This is also the same system that we will, like the buff system that we will also be using for gang links eventually. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, they've got big bonuses to um, the amount of hit points you get from uh, shield extenders and armor plates, so you can use them effectively on super caps as well. Uh, they've got strong resistances to um, enemy E war coming in, especially uh, sensor damps. Uh, and stasis web fire effects, and they've also got impedance that makes any um, assistance effects like uh, remote sensor boosters less effective on you. And then they also have uh, warp core strength. Uh, they can be tackled now by a whole bunch of rifters, but you need quite a few. Plus, four, plus five warp core strength per level, so max of 25. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about 12, 12 rifters with scrams will do it. If you have faction scrams, can go, you can get more. If you're flying uh, navy molluses, you can uh, you get even better than that. Um, just like on the carriers, they're split up to two focused on tank, the Anne and the Wyvern, um, and uh, then two focused on damage and uh, fighter hit points and speed. Uh, and they all have bonuses to their racial E-War uh, burst projectors as well. And also, we're buffing the Revenant quite a bit. So this is the uh, rarest and most valuable of all supercarriers. Uh, it's obtained from low-sec incursions. And uh, we're giving it a crazy afterburner bonus, uh, so it can kind of zip around a little bit. Uh, and it's also getting a much better uh, hit point and slot layout. Um, so it is going to be a very powerful ship. We're very excited to see what people are going to do with this. <laughs> Yeah, the burst projectors, um, we have the set that uh, cover the main uh, racially wars, as well as energy neutralizing, energy neutralizing stasis webs and warp disruptors, which essentially places a bubble across the field. We think these are going to be really powerful, and it's going to be exciting to see how people coordinate together to use them. Um, the way they work is you place a beacon, there you go, in space. And then uh, it launches the beacon to the uh, spot, and then there's a 10 second time for anyone there to get out of the way. But uh, if they fail to, they will get uh, hit by the effect. This is the energy neutralizer effect. And that, that's a yeah, very strong AOE newt. And then here, this is the uh, target painter effect, the burst illuminator. So this can target paint a whole area, which is going to be, I think, a very effective force multiplier if you target paint an entire fleet and then bomb them. <laughs> There you go. Lights them right up. Uh, dreadnoughts are also getting a rebalance. They're getting a utility high, which I think is going to be really cool, allow you to fit uh, neutralizers, give them a really strong role as an anti-cap cap. cap. Um, you'll be essentially use dreads as hero cats. Um, you'll all, also use that for smart bombs or for any other utility you want. You can fit a Sino on them to defend yourself. <laughs> um, you can, they also get resistance, um, and uh, they're going to um, get very high sensor strength and very, very, very high resistance to all E-War in siege mode, but it won't be complete immunity anymore. Uh, just like with the carriers, you have two that focus on tank, uh, the uh, Revelation and the Phoenix, and two that focus more on damage. Uh, we're also adding a new set of weapons for all of the uh, dreads, high angle weapons. So these are designed to hit smaller ships. Uh, they apply kind of similarly to battleship weapons, and uh, they're very, very powerful. It's going to be really cool to see what people do with them. 
And we also have some really amazing stuff coming with Titans. Uh, these things can fit doomsday devices. There's a much larger variety now of doomsdays available. Uh, they can fit uh, the same kind of jump portal generators they could before uh, and use warfare links. Uh, they no longer have full e-war immunity and uh, they no longer have, uh, uh, need to be caught by Hictors. They can uh, be tackled by smaller ships as well. And uh, we've got an uh, example of one of the doomsdays here. This is uh, the old school, yes, uh, old school doomsday. Uh, same kind of concept, it still targets a single target. It now does half the damage, but also can be fired twice as quickly. Uh, and we've added a new skill, doomsday rapid firing, that reduces the cycle time so you can fire it faster and get more damage out. It's about four minutes is the quickest mm -hmm. time you can cycle. And then this is if you want to uh, be really baller and uh, hit, send a beam of energy through the enemy fleet. Uh, these um, doomsdays, the AOE ones, they all have a special function where they suck a cap capacitor from all the ships around you when you fire them, so that if you just jump a big dread or a big uh, titan blob in and all activate your doomsdays, you're going to actually nude each other. Uh, the old school doomsdays don't do that. And uh, that is yeah, I'm nuking one poor guy with the lance and that just fires in a straight duration. You saw the warning beam there, that allows people to get out of the way so that if they're reacting well, but of course, if they're too slow, they get hit by it. And it does damage over time every second while it's uh, active. Uh, this is the Reaper, which is the like a slash weapon. So you see the same kind of idea. You designate the area that it's gonna hit. And there you go. There's a warning beam that shows you the area it's gonna hit, both for you and for any of your opponents to get out of the way. And then this as well newts everyone around you and fires the beam. Does damage to everyone along that path. You can see there you have some explosions. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous weapon. And this is the, uh, the BFG, the bosonic field generator. <laughs> the Society of Conscious Thought is very good at naming their doomsdays. Uh, this one's a short range AOE cone. So it does, there you go, damage to every ship over time uh, that's inside that cone. So if they're fast getting out of the way, they can be in good shape, but if not, this does a ton of damage. Uh, yeah, there's some dreads just exploding from it. Um, it also, like the other AOE uh, doomsdays, has the uh, neutralizer effect. And uh, this is the uh, Gravitational Transportation Field Oscillator, or GTFO. Uh, <laughs> As you see, it fires like the burst projector. And then when it goes off, all the ships within its range are gone. Come on. There it is. And what's happened to them is they've all been moved somewhere else in the solar system. They're all together. Uh, they all get moved in one unit to a semi-random location in the solar system. Uh, the idea here was to provide a weapon that is both very fun to use and very powerful, but also a bit less punishing than just killing the ships, because they can, of course, warp back. If, they, um, if you send some of your own people through as well and make sure that they get caught by it, they can tackle your opponents away. Uh, this does not affect capital ships, so you can't use it to descend a siege fleet away. But any capital ships that are within its radius get uh, warp scrambled um, when it goes off to prevent you from using it to clear tackle off of your caps. Um, we make, the question is what happens if they materialize in the star planet? We make sure that they don't do that. It, it, the, uh, the system actually finds a legitimate place for them and places them there. <laughs> um, yeah, you wanna pass it over to Larrikin now for a bit of modules. So we are introducing, I think it's like 150 or 200 new modules with this expansion, uh, all, kind of based, all kind of based around uh, capitals. Here is a, a list. I am sure I have missed some of them, like the network sensor array. Uh, and all the existing modules, we're also adding meta, tech two, and faction variations. Uh, two that are really worth mentioning. Uh, so the emergency hull energizer, which is a new type of damage control, uh, it makes you invulnerable or it makes your hull invulnerable for a short period of time. It's a great way to dodge doomsdays. Uh, it's a great way to give yourself a little bit more duration uh, survival time against a whole lot of alpha. If people have enough um, capital ships to be alphaing through stuff, it slows that down a lot. Um, and then also the flex hardener. So these are powerful um, armor and shield hardeners limited to one per ship. 
that uh, you can load with scripts to choose what uh, damage type you want to get resistance from or leave them unscripted for Omni. And uh, scripted, they are, they're, they're more powerful than normal hardeners. Uh, yeah. They're kind of in the, the faction range, uh, so they're very, very good. A quick note about the emergency hull energizer as well is uh, once you activate it, it runs for its 20 mm -hmm. seconds, depending on what uh, version you have, and then it burns out, completely burns out after one cycle, so you can't just keep reusing it. Uh, we're also adding Tech 2 ammunition for all of the XL weapons. So there's now Scorch, XL Scorch, and Barrage, and everything else. Um, and we've decided to make a bit of a change where faction guns can now use Tech 2 ammunition. So all faction extra large guns can use Tech 2 ammunition. We will probably roll this back all the way through all of the other yep. uh, faction In guns. In this expansion, it's just for capital guns. But the plan is to extend that to other faction guns in the future. Yeah. So I'm sure there's some uh, wild speculators right now buying up a bunch. Yeah. Um, one other quick note on modules. Um, we're also doing a lot of work with ancillary modules. So we're adding new capital ancillary armor repairs and shield boosters. But then also across capital and all smaller sizes, we've added a new set of ancillary remote repairs. So uh, remote ASBs and remote AARs. So these are both limited to one per ship, both shield and armor, um, but they're very strong. They work just like their local counterparts. So the shield one uses no cap when it is charged, but uses way too much cap when it's uncharged. And the armor one just gets a boost to its strength when it's charged, again, using cap boosters and uh, nanite paste, respectively. Um, we think that's going to provide a cool bit of gameplay for logic pilots, both of the capital size and all the way down as well. Yeah. Uh, we're also changing the way uh, the metal modules work with the new mm -hmm. capital modules that we're introducing. So currently, metal modules are just dropped on NPCs, and in many cases, they're actually cheaper than the Tech 1 variants because they kind of just get dropped for free all the time. All the new capital modules are going to have a BPO that you can buy um, from various corporations scattered through HiSec. So you can go buy this BPO, you can research, you can make copies and everything else. You will then require the Tech 1 item. So if you want to make a, uh, a meta mega pulse laser, you will need the Tech 1 mega pulse laser. And then you will need to go and get some loot that's dropped by capital NPCs. There's electronics, uh, compounds, and conductors. And these are dropped in several flavors. So if you wanted to build a compact, uh, Giga Pulse Laser, then you would need to go and find the compact items. If you wanted to find a uh, build a scoped Mega Pulse Laser, you would need to go and find the scoped items, buy them off the market, kill NPCs, get themselves, whatever you need, combine that with a Tech 1 item and the blueprint, and then you can produce a meta item. It's going to work a very similar way for Faction as well, as you can probably read on the screen there, except the uh, Faction modules will require a Tech 2 item and like our largest, uh, largest selection of these uh, meta drops by that are, yeah. which are dropped by NPCs. And the blueprints for those will drop from NPCs. Yeah, and the blueprints will be dropped by NPCs. And this is really the first step in something we've talked about before on this stage, uh, our dream that eventually everything in EVE be built by players. Uh, right now, the fact that a lot of faction modules and uh, all meta modules are not built by players is something we feel like we can really do better with. So uh, if assuming this works out well with capital modules, the plan would be to eventually roll it out to all meta modules and have everything in the game, every module you can use built by some other player somewhere. Uh, and actually, this is you. Yeah, so um, just connected to these uh, drops, we just mentioned capital NPCs. We're also introducing a new set of capital NPCs. Um, so these drop the named capital module components and faction capital uh, module uh, blueprints, not the modules themselves, actually. Uh, there's three versions of them. These are all appearing in NullSec. There's a normal capital, there's a commander capital, and a commander super capital. Uh, some of you eagle-eyed people have seen the descriptions of these show up on Sissy. Uh, they spawn in Nullsec asteroid belts and in sanctums and havens, including the ones that are created by Sov upgrades. Uh, they have a, they're a rare spawn in all of those cases. So just like you can sometimes get commander spawns from your anomalies in, in your asteroid belts, they also have that kind of random chance. I, the vast majority of the, them by volume are going to be in the sanctums and havens just because there are so many of those run in Nullsec. Um, a little bit less the last uh, month or so uh, for some reason, but uh, still quite a lot. Um, and so they're going to be a nice little jackpot moment. Um, we also have designed them as uh, ships that you may want to bring some friends in to kill. Your normal uh, AFK tar will not uh, be able to kill the Titan. Uh, they have uh, like three and a half million EHP. So not, not like actual super cap player super cap numbers, but 
way more than most NPCs, um, and they, they're very valuable. But beyond just having the uh, components for these uh, modules, uh, the faction ones can also drop faction loot, and their bounties are 60 million for the normal capital, 120 million for the commander capital, and 240 million for the super cap. Uh, so these will, be, these will be worthwhile calling a couple of your friends to help you take them down, or maybe sign them in a dread, something like that. <laughs> We're also making some changes that some people, again, eagle-eyed people have noticed on Sissy, to uh, the tracking system. We're not actually changing the, the base of the tracking system, but we're changing some of the numbers to make it a lot more clear. Uh, so currently, if you wanted to compare two guns, say you're comparing a Tech 1 neutron blaster cannon to 250 millimeter rails, this is the number you get for tracking. Um, both, it's a small fraction, which is a bit tough to kind of internalize really quickly, but also it makes it look like the, uh, the large um, blaster has better tracking than the medium rail which it doesn't. Uh, so it's actually really hard to compare any two guns because you also have to use the signature resolution of the gun. Uh, this is the actual tracking formula uh, in EVE. It's a little bit complicated. That's actually, this image is taken from the EVE Uni Wiki, which is the best documentation of the tracking system anywhere inside or out of CCP. <laughs> <laughs> You're, thank you very much. Um, but yeah, the basic thing you need to know is that uh, tracking speed is essentially, it never matters outside of, um, or never matters independently from the signature resolution. You need to know both numbers. So what we're doing is, we're unifying the signature resolution attribute across all player guns at 40,000. And this would give you numbers that are both a bit more readable and also much more clearly comparable. So now, with the new stats, um, the neutral buster cannon shows 5.19, 250 mm rail 6.56, and this actually reflects the difference in tracking ability between the two weapons. You could actually compare guns for the first time with just one number. Uh, we are calling the number tracking score, I believe. Um, so it's no longer ratings per second, uh, which means that uh, you can no longer use it to compare to the actual uh, transversal of a ship um, traveling around you, but that number was only comparable when the ship's signature radius matched your uh, signature resolution, which is very rare, and you actually don't have full knowledge of the enemy ship's signature uh, radius. It's not something that the client gives you. You can know the base uh, ver value for the ship, but their fittings can affect it, uh, links can affect it, implants can affect it. So this isn't something that we thought was valuable enough to uh, be worth having every module in the game not be comparable to each other. One important thing about these changes, they don't change the actual tracking results at all. So in Citadel, uh, your gun will track just as well as before, but the number looks different. That's just so you can compare it more easily. We do want to, over time, uh, by the way, add some better ways for you to figure out how well you're tracking. Uh, give some better feedback of why you might be missing your target to help new players, especially with this. So there's a couple more things we're changing in this uh, expansion related to uh, ships and module balance. Uh, one big one that we've talked about a lot before is refitting. You'll no longer be able to refit while you have a weapons timer. Uh, this is to uh, ensure that you have some commitment to your fit. You can still refit uh, once that one minute timer is up in combat, um, but there's gonna be some more gameplay we believe around it, and this is gonna open up a lot of other balance options as well. Um, as actually a part of this, one thing that some people might not know is this also will now apply to uh, pulling rigs out of your ship. So to trash a rig on your ship, you will need uh, a fitting service if you're in space, um, and you will need uh, to not have a weapons timer. And just, just really quickly to clarify that, weapons timer is when you shoot someone or you assist someone who is shooting someone, it's not when someone shoots you. Yes, it also, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, something for, from an aggressive action. Yeah. So you can actually just, you can stop shooting for a minute and then uh, be able to refit. Uh, we're also making a tweak to Black Ops battleships. Uh, how many of you guys uh, like to use Black Ops regularly? There you go, a big group over there. It's more over there. Awesome. <laughs> so we're um, cutting the uh, jump fatigue on these ships in half again. They already had a bonus. They cut it in half again. So this is a, a pretty small tweak, but we think it's going to be a nice quality of life improvement, and we're going to be very closely watching the usage metrics, keep an eye on seeing if this takes us in the direction we want to go. Uh, we're also making a tweak to the Higgs Anchor. This mostly applies to wormholers, um, but there was a tactic you could use of jumping back and forth with especially yachts, but also Tech 3 cruisers that are interdiction nullified, cloaky, and have a Higgs Anchor to allow them to close wormholes more effectively. And uh, the combination of all three of those attributes was a bit too strong. So there's now an attribute on the Higgs Anchor rig that uh, while it's fitted, uh, disables an interdiction nullification on that ship. Uh, so mostly something that just applies to the wormholers, but something to make sure you are aware of. 
So we're going to try to, we actually don't have a ton of time left. We went a bit long, so I'm going to try to power through this um, as quickly as possible. Probably not going to have time for a lot of questions. So some of the stuff we're planning on working on next after this expansion. Uh, so coming up very soon, Warfare Links. So I know this is going to be a controversial change. A lot of people are really happy, a lot of people unhappy. Uh, we're switching Warfare Links to be AOE buffs. They will apply to every uh, ship in your fleet that is within an area around you when you activate the module. What they'll leave behind on the ship is an actual buff that has a duration. So if you um, apply this and then leave, the buff will stay. If you apply this and they leave, the buff will stay on them as well, even if they warp away, if they move away from your ship. If you die, the buff stays for a while. It stays for its duration no matter what. So it's not like a... Um, a uh, interdiction nullifier or interdiction bubble that uh, they have to stay within its range to apply. It actually just applies a buff that lasts. Uh, that will apply for that fixed duration. There will be no more need for specific fleet positions for your boosters. So this is something I think has caused some confusion when we've talked about our plans in abstract before. Uh, people were worried that uh, you'd lose, because you have to bring them on grid now, you'd lose your uh, fleet commander, you have to sub somebody into the slot, and that's a pain in the ass. We don't want to make you do that. So what we're doing is the fleet commander positions and wing commander and squad commander, those can still be used for um, how you organize your broadcast. They can still be used for like wing warping and squad warping. And they'll still be used for the, uh, the inherent skill-based bonuses that you get from the skills, not from the modules, though. The modules will apply to everyone in your fleet, no matter what fleet position you're in. The boosting uh, system will no longer have any connection to your fleet hierarchy. Just, just really quickly on the bonuses mm -hmm. as well, uh, they do not stack, guys. So the biggest bonus will apply if you get five damnations all bursting at the same time. Whoever has the most skills, that's the bonus that applies. You can't yeah. stack them up. So they won't stack up, but it will be worthwhile having redundancy. Because if yes. you lose some of them, you will be able to um, have more. And essentially, we want this to be a fleet role like Dictors, like Command Destroyers, uh, like Logi where you have a number of people filling this role. And sure, they may want to kill those people, but they'll have to kill them all. Uh, and you can have ships that are doing this plus other things as well. Uh, so we're also making some big changes to the Rorqual. Uh, we talked about this a bit in the keynote. We're giving them the AOE links as well. Uh, we're giving them uh, a new set of excavator drones. So these are mining super drones uh, using rogue drone tech. They're very, very powerful. The Rorqual will be the single best mining ship in the game which I really feel it should be as this gigantic industrial vessel. Um, we're giving it a mass reduction, which is going to help in uh, wormholes. Uh, so you'll be able to actually take it around a bit if you're really brave um, and move it uh, to support your wormhole mining. Um, I don't expect a ton of people are going to use that, but uh, it'll be a cool option for those that do want to. Uh, and it's going to have the new AOE defensive super weapon. So this will be uh, an ability that will give you and every industrial ship in your fleet within a uh, certain range. Uh, complete invulnerability, but also without the ability to move or leave or shoot people uh, d for that time, for a short period of time. Basically, it's a call for help button. You press that, and then you can bring in some people in combat ships to help save you and get a good fight going. You can kind of queue up a fight in a lot of ways. Um, so we think this is going to be a really effective way to allow you to take advantage of your defensive fleets in NullSec. Because right now, the defensive fleet can almost never get there in time if you get jumped in your mining fleet. This is going to give you that option. So we showed this off yesterday in the keynote. This is the Vanquisher. Uh, it's built by the Guardian's Angels. So for those of you who don't know, the Angels and the Sermitus are allied. Uh, and the Angels actually build all the Sermitus ships. But it is a uh, Sermitus Titan. Um, you've seen the bonuses before. It's going to have a little bit more warp core strength than uh, an Erebus or any other uh, Titan. Uh, and it gets about a 10% increase in damage, or it's an extra 100% on top of a max skilled uh, Erebus Titan, which has uh, about 900%. This gets 1,000%, and it's also not tied to the skill. Uh, again, this is the, the vehement. We showed this off yesterday. Uh, same thing, it's an Erebus, sorry, a Serpentus uh, Moros. I'm really keen to see what happens in wormhole space with these. I'm expecting to see ones that are worth insane amounts of money. I can't wait to see those kill mails. And then this is the Vendetta. So yeah, it looks a lot like a Nyx, built by the Serpentus, or sorry, for the Serpentus. Uh, these are the bonuses that we're looking at giving it. It's going to get the same Webifier bonus to the Stasis Webify Webification Burst Projector. Uh, and a little bit more warp core strength like the Revenant. Uh, all of these ships are going to be really rare. So you should be thinking somewhere around like Revenant rarity. Uh, we're going to, you should watch this space and we'll tell you how to acquire these later on. Uh, yeah, that's it. 
So another thing the Pirate Factions are working on right now, uh, like we said in the keynote, is a new set of implants. So as part of this, uh, for a while it's been a little bit awkward that the uh, Sancha have been uh, using completely armor, dropping armor mods, dropping armor implants, when all of their ships have been shielded for years now. Um, you have to be really old and eager to remember when their ships were armor ships. They used to be a long time ago. Um, but we're adding a new set of um, uh, implants for everybody. The uh, gist of it, we're moving the uh, slave implant bonus, the current one, to a new blood Raider implant, uh, and the slaves will now become a shield HP implant. Um, we'll actually do the name swap, so if you have slaves in your head, you'll get the new Blood Raider one, so you'll have the same functionality, don't worry, if you have them in your cargo hold. Uh, but we're just keeping the name on Sanchez Nation because it fits too well in the lore. Um, but we're adding a new Angel Cartel uh, remote rep cycle speed uh, bonus. Um, we're adding the armor, the current slave bonus to Blood Raiders. Uh, fighter and drone hit points, a big bonus to to that, to Garista's uh, capacitor, to Sanchez, and uh, Serpentis is going to get an armor version of crystals. So uh, we're really excited to see that kind of flesh out the pirate implant line, and it's kind of part of their big technological upgrade they're working on. So let's talk a little bit about jump fatigue. Um, I know this is, of course, a very controversial topic. Um, we don't have a uh, like specific set of changes to announce at this time, but I'm going to talk about the stuff we are working on. Uh, the jump fatigue system, whenever you're work making a design for a game like EVE, there's uh, sometimes going to be mechanical goals and experience goals, uh, how it feels to use the system. Jump fatigue hit the mechanical goals quite well, um, but we dropped the ball in the experience. Um, it does not feel good. We needed a system that felt better than that. You're flying a gigantic capital ship, folding space time, teleporting around, uh, and then you get something called fatigue, which uh, the, you know, the name would work pretty decently if we're describing a real life thing, uh, if there was this phenomenon existed in real life. But this isn't real life. This is epic space opera fantasy, and everything needs to be like 100% more amazeballs for that. So we're working on making the system feel a lot better. You're still not going to teleport everywhere instantly. Um, some of the things we're working on, some of the things we're currently kind of getting our heads around and figuring out exactly how we want to implant it without breaking everything, um, is moving it to a ship-based bonus instead of a um, character-based, moving it to a fixed fixed uh, duration between jumps and a kind of spool up rather than a, uh, a fatigue um, after the jump um, and uh, creating kind of a better experience around it. Um, and also it's a bit more predictable. You shouldn't need to have a calculator for it. Uh, this will probably mean that some types of jumps will get more powerful. Other types of jumps might get a bit less powerful. Um, but we'll be working really hard with you guys to make sure that we get a good balance as well as a much better experience because we really think we can do better here. One thing that I think is going to be actually super controversial to announce today, <laughs> this is uh, a set of changes we are working on to warping and bumping. Uh, so Warwick Heaney is going to send me some super mad emails very soon. Uh, but we have a change in the works that essentially sets a cap on how long you will ever spend in the entering warp stage if you're not pointed. <laughs> You can see some people kind of figuring out the implications of that in staggered fashion there. Uh, what that means is that it, normally we have it set to three minutes. Um, you'll never take more than three minutes to align then. If you bump off another ship or off, a, like if you get caught on a station geometry or caught on a mission geometry, which is actually really common, um, you will never take more than three minutes to enter warp unless, of course, somebody scrambles you. And uh, that means that uh, you'll still be able to bump ships. You'll still be able to bump ships to set up an attack. You'll still be able to use it to, until you can kind of get a point on a ship, but you will not be able to bump people for extended periods of time anymore. <laughs> uh, if you want to bump a miner for three minutes, you can do so. Now I'm going to quickly talk, again, we don't have a ton of time left, I'm going to quickly talk about a concept ship that we've been uh, kind of thinking about for the past little bit, and we really want to get your opinions over the next couple days about. This is something that came from a discussion with the CSM. Uh, they were talking about uh, the issues around FC headshotting, the fact that it can sometimes just kill fights. Um, it's a kind of, it is definitely a cool emergent gameplay, um, but it also uh, really kind of puts a damper on a lot of really good entertainment and getting some good fights. So one of the things that we're thinking about that we'd really like to hear your feedback about is the 
the idea of a dedicated fleet command ship, uh, probably in the battle cruiser size, you can take it only battle cruiser and battleship fleets. They would have no ability to do any damage, no ability to do any E-war, um, but have a ridiculous tank. Um, something that is dedicated to, you can be on grid, you can keep, see the ranges, you don't have to be cloaked away from your ship. You can see where everyone's distance is, you can see what the health of enemy ships are, um, but you would no longer uh, be as vulnerable to being headshot, and it would be kind of a dedicated ship for that. It'd probably be a little bit expensive, um, but we really want to talk a bit more about this. We're going to talk a bit more about it at the round table, and we want to hear what you guys think. Does this sound like a fun ship? Does this sound like something that you think would add to uh, especially large fleet gameplay? Um, or do you think there's problems with it? We want to hear from you. I love you, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the end of the presentation. We normally do questions and answers, but we are actually out of time. So what I will do is point you to our round table. So we've got the capital ships round table immediately after this in the JITA room, uh, and then the ships and modules general round table tomorrow in one room or another. Your schedule says it. Um, <laughs> and we will talk, you answer all your questions, everything we can in those. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank Cheers, you guys. guys.